All right, so here we are, course strategy and logistics. I'm going to go through a lot of different stuff. This is a lot uh, about me. Uh, several of you uh, I've mentioned I've already I've already met. I've run beside you. Um, some of you I'm working with online. Uh, I coach individuals online. Um, I coach through Marathon Training Academy. I also coach through my own um, coaching business. And I'm these are just my certifications, just in case you know. Uh, I do have something to base this information on. <laughs> um, hopefully you find it useful. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start with the pre-race. Uh, I'm just going to go over the geography, the expo, and the breakfast run. And then we're going to launch into race day itself. Uh, for that, we're going to cover the start, the finish, the course, and pacing tips. And then, as I mentioned before, we're going to finish with the Q&A. So here is a little bit about the geography. I'm assuming everybody's kind of booked their hotel already. Hopefully, if not, maybe this will give you a clue about where to book. So this is the general Berlin map. The start and the finish takes place all within the tier garden. You can think of the tier garden in the same way that, you know, New Yorkers think of Central Park. It's a huge park. It's it's pretty central to Berlin. It is right next to the Brandenburg Gate. Uh, I would guess that most of you are probably staying within this vicinity. Um, so it'll make it really easy for you to get to and from the race start and the race finish, which is really convenient. The expo here you can see on the map, it's a little removed. And then also the start of the breakfast run I've also uh, starred there on the map. So you will want to make use of public transportation. In most cases, it works really well in Berlin. Uh, it, it's all really very convenient. Uh, you can use Google Maps to map everything out for you and give you the, the public transit directions. Um, but keep in mind that not everything is within walking distance, right? So if you want to, uh, everybody has to go to the expo, you're required to, but if you want to do the breakfast run as well, um, you're going to need to hop on hop on a tram. There's tram or train. Um, they have buses and, you know, taxis and all of those kinds of things, but public transit is great. All right, so the expo itself, the expo takes place at uh, you know, by the way, I'm going to pronounce these words in my German, which is not at all German, so I apologize in advance. Uh, but the Flugenhofen uh, Tempelhof, which is, uh, it's an old airport is what it is. Um, and so that's kind of cool in itself. It's a really uh, interesting location. Part of the expo is outdoors on, you know, what would be the airfield. And then a part of it is inside um, the old airport terminals. Um, the, the expo does still look like an airport um, in many ways. So when you go in there, you're, you're going to be like, wait a minute, I feel like I sh should be getting on a plane. Yes, that's, that's correct. Um, at the expo, you will find all of the typical things that you would find at a big expo. This is, a, this is a, an expo for a major race. Um, so there will be tons of vendors of course, the official merchandise will be there. Uh, Adidas is the brand for the Berlin Marathon, so they'll have they have a huge store that goes right through the middle. There's tons of picture opportunities. I know everybody wants their selfie with their bib. That's the cool thing to do. They also actually have massages at the expo, which is sort of a weird, interesting thing. Um, and uh, for that, you can uh, either pre-book it or you can pay when you get there if that is something that you are interested in. These are the hours for the expo. Thursday is the first day, Thursday evening, Friday, all, basically uh, all day, and then Saturday all day as well. Uh, these pictures are from the expo itself. As you can see, that picture in the upper left with the huge line outside, that is common uh, for this race. There is a line, you will find a line to get uh, your bib and do all of that bib pickup. Sometimes the line will stretch all the way outside um, so don't be surprised if, if 
you arrive and this expo visit ends up taking a good chunk of of your time um for those who uh are arriving later uh you are going to experience more lines and bigger lines right um just keep that in mind while you're there so the things that you are going to get at the expo there are certain requirements that you that you need from the expo um, and there are certain things that you need to bring as well so the things you need to bring are the start card that will be uh, emailed to you 14 days prior don't worry you don't have it now it's okay you're going to get it um, and you also need to bring your government id you alone are the only person that can pick up your bib you can't send you know your husband wife friend girlfriend whatever um, you have to pick it up and be there in person and your government id has to match um, and then it just for those who may be coming from the airport and you're sort of making a quick trip um, you can go directly to the expo from the airport there is a place to store your bags um, they will they require you to store bags that are over a certain size so really any luggage would have to be stored and there is a fee for that and it is cash so make sure that if you, that's the plan that you're going with make sure you have you know everything sorted before you you know go all the way to the expo the things you are going to get uh there is a wristband it is pictured there in the upper right hand corner this wristband is extremely important it will actually be they will use hot wax um, to attach it uh, to your wrist. It cannot be removed. You cannot remove it without physically cutting it with scissors. Um, you have to keep that wristband on for the entire race duration to get in and out of the start and finish. Um, and this is basically your ID. Uh, the things that you're, the thing, other thing that you're gonna get is the bib. So the race bib for Berlin is completely different than race bibs that we are used to. The race bib in Berlin is a printed sheet of paper. They're, they're going to print your bib off on a regular printer with a regular old piece of paper um, at the expo. It is not sturdy, it is not durable, it is not anything, right? Um, there is no timing chip attached to the bib at all. So most every one of us that are coming from America, we do not own a timing chip because our bibs have these things attached. So I assume all of all of you have booked your timing chip. There is a picture of what the timing chip uh, looks like there in the um, lower left hand corner. It can sometimes be another color. They they come in yellow. They come in red. Um, but basically what it is, it's a little piece of plastic. Um, and so that you are going to need to attach to your shoe um, so that your race can officially be timed and uh, you get a uh, a sort of certificate of completion for the race. Um, the other things that you may get at at the expo are uh, the official bag, the bag that you have to use if you're if you're checking things on race morning. That is as well. You have to book in advance. Um, if you do not opt to do the bag check, then you have the option of getting the poncho, and I'll show you what that poncho looks like. Um, you know, if you don't know exactly what you're going to do now, make sure you have a plan uh, and make sure you know exactly what you are going to be using and bringing and have everything sort of already set out, set aside for race morning. Um, you don't want to think that you're going to use a bag when you did not book a bag and you don't have the bag as an option. They're not going to give you that option unless you use the official bag. Very, very, very important. Please go to the expo as soon as you can. Um, the expo on Thursday, when I ran in 2019, I went on Thursday night. It was a zoo, but there were still things available, um, especially if you want to buy any of the official Adidas stuff. Um, you need to go on Thursday or Friday morning because they will, will be sold out of most sizes and a lot of options completely um, by Saturday. Uh, if you really want to buy merchandise and you know that you're not going to get to the expo until possibly on Saturday, then you need to try to find a way to get to one of the Adidas uh, stores within Berlin. Uh, there are Adidas stores, um, regular retail within uh, Berlin center, um, and you can go there and they will have race merchandise as well. 
but don't count on getting those items at the expo. The expo on Saturday is uh, extremely crowded. Um, it's very busy. A lot of people um, traveling from all over the place, uh, from all over the world for this race are all going to try to come in on Saturday. And, you know, if you're one of those people, you're going to notice all of those, all of the people uh, that are, you know, doing the same thing as you. Um, and the lines will be longer. Just keep that in mind. It's still going to, you know, it's still fine, right? But it's just, if you're landing on Thursday, you know, you can go to the expo that day. Drop your stuff at the hotel or, you know, even take it to the expo and and leave it with their, their bag drop there. So you can just get everything taken care of and everything out of the way. I think it's, you know, it pays off in the lack of stress and lack of, uh, crowd management uh you know to to keep it a relaxing weekend if you can okay the breakfast run so they call it the breakfast run we you know Am americans we have this you know we call it the shakeout run or you know uh new york city marathon or uh chicago have like an official 5k you pay for and you know it's part of the race it's part of the race uh it's part of the race weekend um, well, they don't, they don't have that in Berlin, but they do have the breakfast run and that takes place on Saturday morning. It's a uh, 9 30 AM start. Um, it starts at this, I'm going to try to pronounce it, uh, Schloss Charlottenburg, uh, which is the name of, it's a palace type building. And then it goes, uh, to the Olympic stadium. It finishes within the Olympic stadium itself. Um, these pictures are pictures that I actually took uh, the year I ran it. Um, you do go on to the Olympic Stadium track. It is way freaking cool. Um, there are the Olympic rings outside, as you can see, with this monument. And just, it's a beautiful, it's beautiful, um, uh, really, environment to be in. Um, and so that takes place on Saturday. Here is the course uh, for that uh, breakfast run. The distance is approximately six kilometers, which is a little under four miles. Uh, it is free. It is completely free and it is for everybody. So your friends, your family, aunts, uncles, niece, nieces, nephews, whoever, whoever is with you, they are all welcome to join you for this. Uh, no one, you don't have to be, you don't have to register, right? All you do is show up. There's, there's, it's really like as easy as it, as it comes for, for that kind of thing. It is, keep in mind, I wouldn't, I don't call it a shakeout. It's a very relaxed pace. There are several places where uh, there are bottlenecks and you are forced to walk. Um, basically all of that part from the 4K to the end to the 6K, uh, because people are funneling, they're out on the streets, you're out through the streets. Then you funnel into the Olympic stadium itself through doorways, right? So everybody has to narrow every everybody's, you know, on these big wide streets, hundreds and thousands of people. And then everybody has to narrow to get through these doorways and hallways to, to come out into the Olympic Stadium. And so basically there were several points where we were just walking and there were other points where we were just standing and not moving at all because you're just waiting. You know, you're just waiting for the crowd right to dissipate. Um, so, you know, if you're the type of person depends on, you know, how you're how you feel about running and your legs, you know, treating your legs the day before the race. Um, just know in your head that you're not really going to run this and it's going to be uh, a thing where, you know, you're kind of standing around a lot. You're kind of on your feet a lot. So, uh, you know, gauge that for your own personal comfort level. You know, how do you feel about that? That's up to you. There are snacks available at the end. Free food, hey, everybody can can appreciate free food. Um, there will be many people you'll see. They dress up in their country's flags. They have, you know, their or they have their country's flags. They dress up in their country's colors, um, and you know, it's a very festive sort of patriotic kind of thing. Um, you'll see you'll see groups of people from all over the world, uh, which is really cool. This. Uh, here are pictures from the uh, inside the Olympic Stadium there in the upper uh, right and then the lower right. That's the start um, behind that big banner is that uh, palace that I was uh, mentioning before where you start. 
It's really cool to look at huge old building. Um, and then the upper right, I'm sorry, the upper left shows you uh, what the tables look like and where the food is. So the food, they call it breakfast. I think most Americans would probably not call it breakfast. Uh, that's why I wrote snacks. It's snacks, but it's free, so that's cool. There's pastries, uh, things like packaged croissants. Um, there's donuts, sort of cookies type things. There's yogurt, there's fruit, those uh, apples and bananas. There's, of course, water, huge bottles of water. There is also hot tea and coffee. When I ran in 2019, there was the line to, there were, there, I shouldn't even call it a line. There's no lines for any of this stuff. In this picture, you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but all those people just pressed up together and there's like people reaching their hands this way and that way. That's how it is. There's no queuing, there's no lines, there's no organization, there's no like, oh, if you want coffee, stand here. What people do is they just push and kind of nudge their way to whatever they want to get. So um, it's a, you know, it's a fun, fun festive free for all. Um, but the year that I ran it, I tried desperately to get coffee and I just couldn't deal. It was like, it was too, that was like, you know, the swarms were all there. I could not get coffee, but you know, if you're really super committed, maybe you can get it. Um, there are a lot of picture opportunities as I've seen and shown you. It's a lot of fun, you know, get a group together, get your supporters together and, and just go, you know, plan to enjoy the morning. Um, but don't think of it as so much as a run. That's my that's my tip on that. Bring your patience. As I said, it's you know everybody's there with all of their friends and all of their all of their people too, and nobody's taking anything seriously. And you know it's just a good time, right? So if you go in it with go into it with that idea, you're going to have uh, an amazing experience. Okay. Now, this is a picture of the start map, which is all uh, the start and finish map, because the start and finish are roughly in the same area, which is uh, amazing uh, for New York City marathoners. We are f used to the uh, the point to point course. This is a lot easier, which is good. Here's a schedule for the day. So the first thing to go off is the hand biker elites. Those go off at 850. 857 are the wheelchairs also with the non-elite hand bikers. Then wave one goes off at 915. Wave two, 940, 1005 wave three, and 1030 will be wave four. We're gonna look in detail now at this at this map. Uh, you you'll receive this map in an information uh, booklet. Um, not an actual booklet mail address, but an e-booklet. So you'll be able to look at this closer, um, but we're gonna go through it. So the entire start and finish area is secured with a huge fence. It's like 12 feet tall um, and it is barricaded on all sides. And the only people allowed in, within that area are the, are the runners themselves, no one else. You can't bring your, your friends or your supporters into that area. Um, that is, they're going to check your wristband, so only people with the wristbands are, are allowed through there. There is one entrance, and I've pointed it out there. It is basically in front of the Reichstag. You're going to see and recognize the Reichstag. It's a huge building. It's a, it's a historic uh, landmark, and so you're, you're going to very easily be able to identify that, but just keep in your, in your head that the way you want to go to get in is uh, in front of the Reichstag. Bag drop, if you've opted, opted for bag drop, then there are three places to drop it. As you can see, I've laid them out here. They are basically nowhere near the corrals. So if you are deciding to check a bag, I still recommend, I recommend every everybody, everybody, have throwaway layers on that you can just toss at the last minute before they start your wave um, because you're not going to be able to be layered up standing and waiting for an hour to 45 minutes in the corrals. Um, your stuff is going to have to be off in the bag drop if you've opted for bag drop and it gets cold. Uh, you're, you know, you're just going to be standing around in an open park for a while. So make sure you have something warm, um, you know, 
from a thrift store, old clothes, you know, borrow something from your, you know, your grandparents, whatever. But just something that you don't care about, you're going to toss. The corral lineup, I've outlined it there. It's basically uh, just a long street. And um, the corral lineup, I, I, you know, it's a little bit lacking, uh, frankly. It's not what we're used to. Uh, in terms of like a New York or a Boston or a Chicago um, in that it's just a little bit more of a free for all and the the barricades between are not really um, they're about you know waist high fences uh, just not even fences waist high barricades that can easily be climbed over um, and people do climb over them and, you know, you're supposed to, you know, technically, you know, people are supposed to check your bid, you know, check your bid and make sure you're lining up in the right spot. Well, that doesn't really happen here. Um, it's, you know, just sort of like, we trust you guys, you know, we we hope you line up in the right place. Um, and so <laughs> um, it's, a you know, we're like, a lot of us are used to a little more thoroughness and, you know, like policing in terms of like, you can enter and no, you cannot enter and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and also in the, a lot of the other majors, like the corrals will close at a certain time and then you cannot enter or exit the corrals at a certain time. This is not like that at all. People are just coming and going, climbing over the barricades, pushing their way through here, there, everywhere. There's not a lot of division between everything in the corrals themselves. Yay. Um, <laughs> just keep that in mind. Uh, one thing that's kind of good about that is because there's, there's no porta potties within the corrals themselves. The porta potties are all outside, and they uh, are all outside the corrals. And there are some that are lined up sort of near the the corrals, which is great. But um, you can't be waiting in line and in the corral at the same time, right? So you have to pick. So it's either do I need to go to the bathroom or do I want to get a good spot in the corral? And these are sort of things that you have to figure out. Um, but that is also why you will see people climbing over the barricades because you know, they just spent like 30 or 45 minutes, you know, waiting in the corral and then they had to go to the bathroom and then they had to, then they wanted to get back in the corral. So this is what happens. Um, this is the finish area I've highlighted there. Um, when, when you do finish, you'll do a nice little walk off. Everybody follows the same path. And then all of the finish amenities are all within the same area. They do give you water. They give you non-alcoholic beer. Um, which is a very German thing. There are snacks, there's bananas and apples and things like that. If you opted for the poncho option and you didn't pick and you didn't do the bag check, then that's where you get that. Um, there are two sort of, everybody gets this like a, plas a piece of plastic basically, which is sort of like a, a fancy garbage bag. Everybody gets that. But the people that opted to not do the bag check, they get this thicker um, poncho that has a hood and a Velcro strap. I have a picture of it coming up here later. It's not as nice as a New York City uh, marathon poncho. It's not thick like that, but it is, it's a, it's a cool souvenir. Um, there's an engraving uh, for your metal and uh, massages as well. But I'm gonna go through more of the finished details here in a bit. These are all of the exits. As you can see, there are several exits to choose from. So, you know, while you can only go in one way, you can exit out in any different direction depending upon where you're staying. Um, lots of options there. Make sure you return your chip. Uh, that is super important. Uh, those are located at all the exits and there will be signs too to remind you. All right, the start. I kind of already went into a detail about it a little bit but these are the pictures here um everybody is assigned to a wave based on their expected finish time anybody who said that they were uh planning to finish under 315 was required to submit proof um but as i stated before there's not a lot of checking uh there on the ground and the barricades make it so that you know people can kind of come and go as they please a little bit um, the start is everybody's really packed in. It's real crowded. Okay. You can see from the pictures here, it's shoulder to shoulder. Um, and it's a little bit uncomfortable in that you will probably be waiting there for a while 
but but that said they play music there's there's actual dancing that that goes on they you know they lead you through different chants and songs and things like that um they have huge screens set up and speakers and all of this kind of stuff so they do really try to make it fun for everybody but you you just plan to be standing there and waiting for a little while i really do recommend i can't say this enough that if you are running for time you want to get yourself there early um it's it's a race it's like 40 i mean it's 40,000 people right if you can put yourself in front of an extra 500 um and you really want to do well at this race it is worth your time and effort to get yourself there and put yourself in front of an extra 500 people um the course is really crowded uh the start is really crowded the course is really crowded um it does sort of spread out a little bit but again you you just you don't want to waste a lot of energy trying to move around a bunch of people so do your best do your diligence try to get there early try to stake out your spot um try to get get taken care of all the porta potty stuff really early first thing and then get your spot in the corral that's my recommendation okay pacers if you are looking for pacers they have pacers assigned to every wave Wave one, three hours, 3.15, 3.30. Wave two, three, 3.15, 3.30, 3.45. Wave three, 3.30, 3.45, 4, 4.15. 4, Wave four, 4.15, 4.30, 4.45, 5. So there is some overlap there, but they're assigned, you know, to every wave, which is really great. You can see them very clearly. They have to wear this giant flag. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine actually running a marathon with a sail attached to my back, but they do it, okay? They're so committed to this uh, endeavor. Uh, and so you'll see them very clearly out on the course. Um, if you, you know, have any inclination to use a pacer, I I personally, I'm, I'm biased because I act as a pacer myself and here in New York for local races. So, you know, I'm always like, hey, team pacer. Um, but you know, it's they're they're usually good people and they really want everybody to have a good time. So consider that option uh if that's something that you're interested in. Okay, a little bit more detail here on the finish. Um there in the center picture, that's what the poncho option looks like. Um, it's you know, it has the logo on it and the hood and all of that kind of stuff. It's a really cool, you know, souvenir. I have mine still. Um, it's it's just not super thick. Like the ones in New York have the the fleece lining inside inside. So this isn't quite that thick, um, but it's it's great. It's and it works really well for you know getting you back to your hotel if that's the option you chose. Um, if you have opted for the bag check, there are showers at the finish line, which is that's cool. That's not an American thing at all. Um, they have showers and changing tents there um, within the finish area. So, you know, if if that was something that you've selected, you know, you're going to be really set up to put on clean clothes and go have lunch and celebrate with everybody. Um, if, you know, uh, if you did the poncho thing, then I'm assuming you're going to go back to the hotel and put on something clean and fresh uh, for the rest of your day. They are also giving free massages at the finish, within the finish line. There's a picture there. Um, there are, I read this, they're actually students, uh, apparently. Um, and so there's no charge for the, for the massage at the, at the finish line festival. Um, personally, the, the notion of anybody squeezing my muscles at the end of the marathon is just like makes like I can, it's painful to me, but I'm sure some people love it. Um, the metal engraving, if you would like to get your metal engraved at the finish, they will do it for you at the finish. You have to bring cash though. Okay. That is something uh, that, you know, again, is a really unique experience, but it, if you want to take advantage, you know, just make sure you have the, the money for it. There, uh, in this far picture, uh, all the way to the right, that is a picture of the metal. And then in the background, it's a little bit fuzzy. You can't really see it, but that is the Reichstag. So huge domed building. Uh, you can see it for a long way away. So you'll know exactly where, where it is, uh, the enter the entrance to, to get into the uh to the start in the that morning. Another reminder, drop your timing chick in the bucket before you exit. This is a picture of what the bucket looks like, and it's written in beautiful German, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Return your chip here, something to that effect, right? 
Um, there are six places to return it, which is are all the exits. It's available until 5.30 p.m. So happens if you, you know, walk off and get all the way back to your hotel and you're taking your shoe off and you, for, you realize, oh, no, I forgot. Go ahead and bring it back. There is a fee if you forget. It's not a lot of money. It's, I mean, it's not, but it's also like a useless, useless piece of plastic that's not going to, not going to provide any service to you in the future. So, um, you know, you probably just want to return it. Um, I recommend people when you're lacing it into your shoe, um, try to put it near the top because you are going to have to undo this. You're going to have to bend down and undo your laces and remove this thing after you've run 26.2 miles. And I don't know about you, but nobody's in a good shape to bend and flex and do all of these kinds of, you know, uh, stretching kinds of calisthenics at the end of a marathon. So put it near the top of your shoe, but don't tie it, you know, tie it in securely, but just somewhere near the top. You don't need to lace it halfway down because you're not going to keep it, right? Okay, the course elevation. This is going to be the simplest slide of the entire thing because there is not much. This is it. It looks huge on this. Like if you're looking at this and you're going, it's like the Queensboro Bridge in the middle of Berlin, but it's not. That's a lie. It is 15 meters over about a 5K, a little over a 5K, which is 50 feet, 50 feet over three miles. That's nothing, folks. Um, again, for a comparison, uh, you know, the Queensboro Bridge is a over 100 foot climb uh, in the course of a mile. So this is much smaller. It's much smaller. It's not, it's nothing. Um, in fact, I, in preparing this, I realized that I didn't even, there's no recognition of that climb. In running this marathon, I have no, no memory of any kind of climbing in, in the entire marathon. Um, Berlin is the flattest of the majors. I say this, and this is contra it's sort of controversial. Some people are like, Chicago's flatter, blah, blah, blah. Um, the difference between like Chicago, which is also very, very flat, but the Berlin is like, this gain is so stretched out that again, it's imperceptible. Um, the, the climbs in Chicago are, are noticeable. They're short fat, they, you know, they're not big climbs, but they're all short. They're, they're sort of short and steep. Um, and they're all bridges and you're climbing over rivers. So it's, it's a noticeable climb. You can see with your eyes, this is not a noticeable climb. You're going to notice at all, but I do tell you that it's there. And so be aware. And that shows you where it is on the map. They're around the 20 K. The thing about this course that you want to keep in mind is there are a lot of turns. There are over 40 turns in this course. I counted them. It's more than 40. It's a lot of turning. Um, and that has an impact on your time. It has an impact on your watch, which is one thing we're going to go over in detail with the pacing section. I do say here, run the tangents, which I'm going to also say when you can, which is maybe never, because... <laughs> Uh, as I said before, it's a really, it's, it's a very crowded race. And frankly, uh, you're just not going to have the option, right? You're going to look to your right. There's going to be a person there. You're going to look to your left. There's a person there. There's a person in front of you. There's a person behind you. So it's not going to be like, oh, I think I'll run on this tangent line. No, you're not just, yes, it's good. I have, as a coach, I have to say, please run the tangents because you're going to run an extra distance. But the reality on the ground is like, you're really not going to have that option most of the time. Perhaps, perhaps, depending upon where you start, like if you start way at the front, like if you're in wave one corral A, you're maybe, you're probably going to have a little bit of clear space there towards the end, 35K, 40K, something like that. In which case, please, please run the tangents then, right? When you have that option. <clears throat> Eight stations. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the aid stations. You're going to think maybe that's silly, but I promise you this is worth the the time. The aid stations here, this is one of those things. It's it's just it's really different than we're used to in New York or Chicago or Berlin or Boston or any of the other majors, um, any of the other marathons that you may do really in in America. They're different, and this can have a huge impact on your race and you can help your race and yourself by 
planning ahead. So I want you to think about this, listen to what I'm saying, and then also think about it in these next couple of days and weeks. Oh, they have, they do, they're, the aid stations are well stocked where they have them. They have aid stations that uh, give you a couple of things, fruit, with, which uh, is a banana. There is tea, it's not hot tea, it's cold tea, um, and then there's water. And then there are aid stations that are only water. Um, and those are all the locations. So you can see them there on the map. That's great. Look at that. Lots of things, lots of places. But it's not what we're used to. Okay. So in the beginning, they are every three three k, roughly for the first half, and then they add. They become a little bit more frequent towards the end. They become every two k. That's not bad. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But if you've run in New York or Chicago or Boston, again, I keep bringing these up, but we are used to having these every single mile. That's how we are used to racing. They are not going to be that frequent there. There's another thing that you want to keep in mind. These are on one side of the street only. One side of the street. That is a very key thing when you are out in a crowded course and you don't have a lot of room to move. They are also really small. It's one or two tables only. That's it. Again, going back to the other majors, we are used to huge blocks long, 20 volunteers, everybody's standing in a long line. You can get one cup at the beginning. You can get one cup in the middle. You can get one cup at the end. This is not that. Do away with that notion. You will not have that option for this race. There are porta potties at the end of each, which is super cool. Uh, so they're pretty frequent if you need that option. They do provide something. This is, uh, it's a, it takes a little bit of work on your part. You are able to bring a bottle, your own bottle, supply your own bottle with whatever your own fluids are, and you can drop them off in advance and they will have it on the front, one of the front tables. It will be in the front table before the other um, aid station options, the bananas and the and the water and that that sort of thing. You have to label your bottle. It has to be labeled clearly. You have to bring it um, basically to the expo um, or the uh, day before you can bring it uh, to the start area there. And it just it all has to be labeled. And you really if you're going to do that, you got to really I recommend practicing it and being very clear about what bottles you're going to use where and how you're going to label them. I have done that. I have done this um, before for other races. So if you want tips on that, I can give you uh, tips on that. We can just sidebar on it, um, uh, you know, after this or, or another day, you can email me. This is a picture of the aid stations. Another thing that's super important. These are all, everything's in plastic cups. If if you're used to racing in the US and you're used to, you know, you know the trick with the, the paper cup where you squeeze the top, you pick it up, you squeeze the top so it makes a little tiny opening to funnel and you can then drink like a little tiny sips are coming into your mouth while you continue running. This is not an option with these cups, okay? They're, they're a little bendable plastic, but you cannot make that that small narrow opening and it, it makes it really hard to drink from these while you run. Um, just, just know this, okay? Uh, the other thing about these cups is they're really slippery. Um, this picture here you can, is from the year that I ran where it's like you can see that everything's like water soaked and you know covered. Um, so even but even if it wasn't, uh, you know, raining that day uh, during the race, these, you know, I mean, you've done, you've been in an aid station, right? Like people are dumping water and, you know, half getting half of it in their mouth and half of it on the ground and et cetera. So there's always water and liquids all over the floor, uh, floor, the ground. Um, and so they just, they're really slippery. So if you see someone, if you see a cup right in front of your, your feet go, you know, go down in front of your feet, please don't, Try not to step on it as best you can, right? It's just, it, uh, there were a couple of points, this has happened to anybody who's done this race before, where like, you know, cause you're pressing with force and it's just that little bit of slick is like, woo, and it's it's scary. So be careful. 
if you can in you know help help out the you know the runners around you and yourself try to throw the the cups into the the dumpster it's a giant dumpster you can see it in that picture it's that big yellow thing huge dumpster right so it's a great target and if you can try to get it in there that's awesome the only thing that makes it difficult is that if you're one of those people i'm i'm one of these people where i kind of grab the cup and i keep running and i'll take sips and i'm drinking you know way past the aid station um then you're not going to have the option of the big dumpster anymore but if you can please try to throw your cup off to the side so it's not in the middle of everyone's path that would be super cool if you can remember that I'm pointing this out. I want everybody to notice there is no there is no water on that side of the street, right? <clears throat> so all of those runners that are running over there, they're not getting any water. Um unless they do a thing where they literally make a cut like cut a beeline straight over to one of the very small tables where there is water. Um the <laughs> There's no way to know in advance unless you literally go map out the entire course yourself on your own feet, but which side the aid stations are going to be on. Um, because it, it's not uniform, right? There's no rhyme or reason. It's not like, well, there is a reason, but it's not, it's not in a numerical type thing, right? So it's not like, oh, it goes right and then it goes left and then right and then left, or it's odd and even or something. It's not nothing like that. The reason there are eight stations on some sides is because um, this picture is a good example. <clears throat> There's retail and sidewalks on on one side, right? And then on the other side is a median with with uh, planters and, you know, cobblestones and all of that stuff. So there's no room for them to put an aid station on that side. So that is how the aid stations are laid out. There are there is a sign that's telling you there's an aid station uh, coming. So when you see that, you just have to do whatever you can as best you can to get your way over to that aid station if you are dependent on this water. And again, they're not as frequent as we're used to. So I make sure you <clears throat> make sure you're getting the water. That's super important. Consider carrying your own handheld or belt or vest. Um, <clears throat> one thing that is nice about this race uh, in contrast to these American races, you are allowed to bring a hydration vest. You are allowed to bring a bladder full of water. Um, <clears throat> they don't have all of those security concerns that we have here in, in New York or Boston. Um, when I ran in 2019, I had a belt with a bottle on it and I had a handheld um, <clears throat> that I started the race with as well, which I tossed after about the first 10K. Um, and so I was able to, you know, not worry about some of these aid stations. I still ha did have to make use of some of them because it's a, it's a long race and I didn't carry enough for 26.2 miles. Um, <clears throat> but it's nice to have some options where you don't have to panic about, oh my God, I'm on the wrong side and the water's over there. That is a nice option to have. Um, it's good to also keep in mind that, you know, maybe conditions are not going to be as cool as you would hope. Maybe it's going to be a little bit more humid. And so, again, the water becomes really important for preventing dehydration and preventing, you know, hitting the wall. Um, so you might want to have a backup option, like in case conditions are worse than, you know, we hope they are. We hope it's going to be beautiful, cool fall day. Um, but just in case not, and you really, really need to hydrate well, uh, you might want to bring a backup option. Okay, one last thing on the aid stations. They do provide Morton fuel, which is super cool. They didn't have this when I ran in 2019, but they have uh, these, all of these stops are uh, the Morton 360, which is a water-based uh, drink with, it's a little bit sweet and it has carbohydrates in it. And then there's one stop there that, that they provide the Morton gel. So, you know, if you are someone who's maybe used to carrying your own fuel, this is a race where perhaps you don't have to if you are, you know, if your stomach can handle the Morton. Um, you know, they there are enough stations here where that's enough carbohydrates. Between that and the bananas, you could be well covered for this race. Um, but the 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 water hydration situation could could use some attention.
possibly. Ah, OK, a couple more details about the course. Um, I'm not going to go through it mile by mile because for the most part, there's sort of not that much distinctive about it. Um, if you think about it, uh, like for this New Yorkers, like when you do that part and you're sort of running through Brooklyn and it's just, you know, brownstones and, you know, there's a retail section and there's brownstones and then there's, you know, going through Queens and all that. There's not there's not a lot of landmarks. There's not a lot of anything. You're kind of just you're like in the quote, the burbs, the city of the burbs, the burbs of the city, right? Or something like that. Um, so a lot of Berlin is like that. Um, you know, you're not going to go through and sort of be like, oh, look at that. You know, it's not like a sightseeing tour, um, except for this part uh, where you go through the Brandenburg gates, which is near the end of the race, but it's not the actual end of the race. Um, when you look down at your watch, it's going to be very close to 26.2. If it's, you know, it's 26.1 or, you know, it may even be at 26.2 at that point. That's still not the end. The end is about, you know, 400, 500 meters past the, the Brandenburg gates. So um, when you get to those, you can see them coming ahead of you um, for a long way. And it gets really exciting. You know, you're almost done. Um, but just keep running through them. Some people do do kind of stop. Um, there are a lot of photographers here. Uh, this is my actual pic, the one on the left there. That's my actual picture from the Brandenburg gates. And there's a ton of photographers at the finish. If you're a person that likes pictures, I do recommend you buy your picture package. It's a really good deal. It's a lot cheaper than we pay here uh, for the US majors. And they give you a ton of photographs and they're really uh, high quality. So if that's the thing that you're into, um, first of all, smile when you get through the band there at the Brandenburg and then also make sure you buy your photo package. Another note about the course, there is a blue line which marks the shortest distance and it does mark the uh, the entire course all the way along. I just I I'm posting this entire thing. Um, which was uh, posted on the Berlin Marathon website in 2012. And I post it just because it does point out the fact that in in New York City Marathon, they do mark the course with the blue line, but it is not the tangent line. It is not the, the shortest distance. It's actually um, 43 kilometers, so it's almost a full kilometer longer to run on the blue line in New York City Marathon. Um, but in for Berlin, it is the it is the marked tangent line, the shortest distance. That is the certified distance, which is 42,195 meters for those who are curious. Again, here pictures of the course itself. These are my actual pictures and they're like it's like a where, where's Waldo right in some of these like I'm, I'm in here and I know where I am, but good luck finding me because it's a sea of faces and a sea of runners. Um, so I, I said this before, it's really hard to to stay stay on the tangent line, even if you know where it is, that's super cool. You're probably not going to be able to run on it, which means you're going to end up running more than 26.2 miles. Pacing. This is super, super important. There are no mo mile markers anywhere on the course. They don't use miles. <laughs> they use metric. Um, they're very metric centric. Um, and so everything is marked in kilometers. That's it. Kilometers. Um, do not expect any mile markers, but I'm going to explain how to pace for four kilometers uh, in the next segment. My huge recommendation on this, whatever you do, just have a plan and know what you're going to do. Do not go leave it up to chance and just start the race and be like, well, I don't know what, where am I at on course? What time am I running? Where am I, you know, like, you don't want to be trying to do like uh, <laughs> conversions. What's, what's 17K in miles? Like no one wants to be doing math while they're like trying to run a marathon. So just have a plan, whatever the plan is, Make sure you know what it is and think about it in advance. I'm going to tell you what my what my tips are, but you're welcome to do your own thing. Um, I do know some people I've heard this before that are they say things like, well, put your watch in kilometers. 
I, I said that because I said that in a way that is mocking because I think it's not good advice. That's my personal feeling on that because again, <clears throat> I don't train in kilometers. I don't know what a kilometer is. I don't know what my pace in kilometers is. Like, so that's not helpful to me. And I don't want to have to be thinking and doing math while I'm running. There is another way. I've said, I say it again, this course, there's a lot of turns, 40 tur over 40 turns and your watch is going to be off. You're not going to be able to run the tangent line as well. So there are several things going on at play. So when you're pacing, make sure you keep all of these things in mind. You are going to run extra distance. I just said that. You're going to run extra distance because you're not going to be able to run the tangent line. And on top of that, GPS technology has a couple of, there's a couple of quirks with it, right? And the more turns you make, the more tricky it is. And we're going to, I'm going to explain why. <clears throat> Your watch, if you use a Garmin or a Coros, it uses GPS and satellites. People don't realize this. I'm going to state the obvious, but a satellite, it, it orbits the Earth, right? It is like out in space. <clears throat> and so, sorry, one second. <clears throat> <clears throat> so um, there are a number of things that can impact that, right? And it's not 100% right. It's just not. So please don't say, well, my watch said blah, blah, blah. It's it's OK. Like we're going to we're going to account for the discrepancies. But you need to know that your watch is subject to several things going on. <clears throat> One of the things interference. And the other thing, recording gaps. What are interference? What is interference? So the, Normally we call it like, this is from the Garmin website. These are from the technology um, specs within, within the help menus and the FAQs. If you dig into all of this, you can read it yourself. Um, <clears throat> environmental factors, what is that? Tall buildings and large groups of people resorts, results in poor GPS track. Well, I have got news for you, a major marathon in a city, any city in the world is going to have a lot of tall buildings and there's going to be a large, lot of large groups of people. So you have two out of three of those factors going on. So that's environmental factors that cause interference. Second thing, recording gaps. Um, you can actually adjust the settings on your watch. Um, your watch in, in, in default mode is not recording every second of what you do. Your watch is set to do what's called smart recording. And so what does that mean? It's recording at at intervals. It's not recording every single thing you do. It's recording with gaps. There are gaps in between. And so this are uh, this is a chart uh, with little little diagrams showing the difference between smart recording and every second recording. Uh, again, the smart recording is the is the one on the top. That's what your watch is set to uh, by default. The reason it's set to that is because it saves the battery. It's it's it allows you to get through the 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 entire race in a couple of days, right, or something like that, um, depending upon the model and how old it is. Every second recording, however, provides a lot more detail. So you can see there, I've highlight I've highlighted. In uh, example B on the diagram, all those are not being recorded in 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 the same way, right? Your movement is not being recorded in the same way, depending upon which recording setting you have set up. However, if you are going to use every second recording, you need to know that it is a battery drain. And if you're a person that's like, oh, I'm gonna like play music from my watch, and I'm gonna like time the whole marathon and you know I maybe I forgot to charge it the like fully the the morning of or whatever you need to be aware that that could possibly drain the battery and I can't think of anything worse than being in the middle of a marathon and having your watch die so I recommend if you are even going to consider that option you really have to test this out and you need to test it out in training and hopefully for one of your longest long runs so that you know that it'll will even make it through um, because that would be a catastrophe. And I don't want anybody to be like, Kristen told me to set it to say every second and then my watch didn't make it. Um, I, 
you know, keep in mind in terms of the distance, I've said it a million times, but you're not going to be able to run the tangents. You're going to run more than 26.2 miles. Everybody's doing a, everybody's doing a, a, an ultra, right? As soon as you cross 26.3 miles, you, you're, you've done an ultra. So congratulations, everybody. These are the settings that what I recommend. That she's Someone's uh, mic is open. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> ah, that's okay. Um, almost done here. So these are those settings that I recommend everybody uh, use for your watch. Again, do do whatever you like. Um, but you know, this is what I recommend as um, someone who's been a pacer for marathons and has had to come in at exact an exact time. Um, this is what I use. Um, Four things, and I recommend they're all on one screen. There, there are there are options for this. There are tons of apps you can download for free, um, but you can also just create these settings uh, your own on your watch. But the the ones I recommend: current pace, average pace, distance, and elapsed time. Two that are super important: the average pace. Um, you want to know what your average pace is because hopefully you've been training at a pace and you know what that target is. And when you look down at your watch, you want to see how you're doing on that target. Um, it's totally fine and normal to, you know, vary a little bit between miles and, and Ks. And, and so, you know, you don't really need to worry about where you are at every exact moment of a marathon. It's like three plus hour race, um, four plus hour race for some folks. And so you don't need to stress over every second, but you do need to know like in the general, like where am I in terms of my goal? So the average is good for that. The elapsed time, the elapsed time is super important and I'm gonna explain why, particularly um, it's super important for a race that is only marked in kilometers. So when I pace a race, uh, the, the course is measured and marked and certified and my chip time is going to give me the, the the time and the pace based on that course. And so again, it doesn't matter what your watch says. Your watch can say whatever the heck it wants. The chip is what matters. And if you start your watch and press start, as soon as you cross the official timing mat, you will know by looking at the elapsed time where you are in terms of what that chip should be reading. Um, and you can use the on-course markers to, to tell you that. And I recommend using the on-course markers and the elapsed time with um, your goal in mind as checkpoints to know that you are either on pace, uh, you know, ahead of pace, behind pace, how much you need to adjust all of those things. So I recommend a combination of using your watch plus some written cues, written targets. My recommendation, especially for a race in kilometers, is to break it down into every 5K. 5Ks are easy. We, you know, Imperial using uh, Americans are pretty good at knowing what a 5K is. And it's also like a nice, easy number, 5, 10, 15, 20. Like we can break down things really easily that way. Um, if you are, if your target is a 330, which is eight minutes a mile, then you can know that you every 5k should be 24 minutes and 51 seconds now once you start getting up to 15k 20k 25k etc a lot of you are not going to be able to do that mental math and that's fine you know why because we have online tools hooray to the rescue you don't have to figure any of this stuff out on your own but you do have to do your homework um so there are several online online pace band calculators. They're completely free. You can opt to buy your own pace band in advance and have it sent to you and it'll be all shiny and new and fancy and target it to your exact time. If you want to do that, you can opt for that. Personally, I never do that. I just write it on a, <laughs> a little note card. What I do is I write it on a little note card for myself and then I put clear tape on all sides. And then I took this little note card, I took it into my uh, the pocket of my shorts. And then I, you know, can reference it at points where I want to. Again, you know, using the 5Ks, it's pretty easy. I'm just pulling it out, you know, every 5K or so and saying, okay, at, you know, 10K, I'm supposed to be at whatever, 58.15, say what this watch says. And what does my watch say? And what, what am I supposed to be at? 
And how many seconds off am I if I'm off? Um, so these are the resources that uh, I've listed here. There's surely more. My favorite I listed first is findmymarathon.com. You can go and they actually have course specific and effort-based pace bands. So you can tell the on Find My Marathon, you can say, I want to run a negative split uh, race. I want to run a Hopefully you don't want to run a positive split, but you know, you could set it to say that and run a pot, you know, give you the times for a positive split. Um, the course specific, it's not super important for this race because as I outlined with the elevation, it's a pretty flat race. Um, this is not like, um, you know, a Boston or a New York is good examples because for both of those races, there are a hundred foot climbs and there are a hundred foot drops. So your paces for, you know, races like that, really do, do vary by quite a lot. Um, this race is not really uh, in that um, umbrella at all. Um, my general recommendation um, for everybody would be to go in with a negative split um, approach, which would be to run the second half faster than the first half. Several reasons for that. One is just it's good, smart, conservative racing, um, particularly for a long race like a marathon. Um, but in a, the other consideration, um, particularly with a race like this, where I said, again, it's really crowded and it's more crowded at the beginning and you're not going to have a lot of room to move. And even if you wanted to go around people and maybe you will go around people, you know, within the first, uh, 10 K or the, you know, the first 20 K or something like that. You just don't want to spend up all of your energy going around and around and around and adding up, um, you know, more distance and, you know, more frustration. Right. And so it's just it's the payoff for that is not really there. Um, it's better to. Kind of chill, try to conserve as much energy as you possibly can go with the flow in the first half know that there's going to be some people around you. They're going to probably maybe slow you down in a couple of points. Um, <clears throat> one thing I didn't mention about this course, um, the course does narrow in certain points. So there's big wide avenues. Like when you start in the park, you're on a big, huge wide street. And then you go to some of these little, um, uh, you know, historic little um, neighborhoods, you know, very quiet little neighborhoods, not big retail centers, um, right, with huge avenues, but just, you know, quiet neighborhood streets. And so there are points where the course narrows by several feet, right? And so there are places where you can, you know, spread out and maybe you can wiggle your, your elbows around a little bit. And then there are places where everybody has to come together and you lose all of that elbow room that you had, right? So there's, because of all those turns, 40 plus turns, right? You just don't want to waste energy going, I have to shove my way this way and I have to shove my way that way and I got to get around this and that. And it's, it's, it's a lot. So negative split strategy, that's what I recommend. You're going to find course clears out a little bit more. Um, the further along you go. And so you're going to have more, you're just going to be able to move easier. You're going to be able to speed up easier. So try to do everything easier. That's always um, <clears throat> a good tactic for a race day, um, particularly a marathon, again, where you're just, you're going to be out there for a long time. Q&A, hooray, we made it. Um, anyone have questions? Open up your mic and speak. Hey, Coach, this was awesome. Thanks so much for going through <laughs> this. Um, I just had a couple quick logistical things to see yeah. if you remembered. Um, I feel like I read that when you pick up your stuff at the expo, that they include some kind of like card in there to use on public transportation if you're just kind of going around yes. Berlin. Yes. Okay. Um, so maybe if you're getting in early, maybe even a better reason to go get that sooner than later so that you can use it while you're there. Yes. Yes, that is a good point. I did. I did read that and, and it has been mentioned for this year. So I expect that to be the case. Um, all of the so all of the information that I pulled uh, for the most part was technically from the information booklet from the previous year. Um, they have not published the the race information booklet for this year. 
yet. I expect it will come out either, you know, sometime this week or next. Um, but again, all of that information will be uh, mailed to you, uh, re emailed to you directly. But yes, I did read that. And I do expect that to be the case. So yes, you, you know, free public transit, which is, which is awesome. Um, after you get uh, your race materials. Yes. Cool. And then, sorry, one other thing. Uh -huh. um, I know you mentioned with the metal engraving to mm -hmm. have cash on hand, but I know that like I kind of like pre-ordered that mm -hmm. in my package when I signed up. And so will I just get some kind of like email confirmation or something that I'll have to show? I am not sure what the confirmation is, um, but yes, that is that is an option. And there was an option as well. Um, some of you, uh, I didn't mention this with the with the official race merchandise, but you were able to pre-book some of that. And so, you know, if you pre-ordered your official Berlin jacket, all of that stuff will be waiting for you, right? So you don't have to worry if you're one of those people that's like, oh man, I'm not coming in until Saturday and I'm not going to have my choice or whatever. If you pre pre-ordered it, you're fine. They're going to have exactly what you want. It's just for people that didn't pay in advance or didn't plan, you know, haven't, didn't set up that, you know, option um, in their account. So those are the people that need to worry. But yes, uh, for that metal engraving, um, you could have pre-booked that as well. Yes. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Um, Kristen? Yes. yes. Are there... Oh, go ahead. Oh, um, are there any places along the course where the road surface is wonky or like cobblestones or something odd or not, you know? Yeah, there are a couple. Yeah, I there are a couple of places where you do need to watch your feet. Um, so, you know, the, a lot, you know, the start and the end especially are through, and, and those areas around there are through historic districts and historic areas. And so the roads there are definitely a little bit worse for wear in some places. Like, um, I just remember huge potholes like i mean like deep in in divots and things like that um and so you know they you know a lot of people are sort of aware and and like you know giving little high signs and things like that when they're running by it so for the most part you know as long as you have your head up and are and are aware of what's going on around you it shouldn't catch you by surprise because the people that are in front of you are gonna you know alert you to that but yes, there are points like that. Um, I don't recall any cobblestone areas, um, but I do. I do definitely. Re you know, the areas where the aid stations are, um, as I mentioned before, are very uh, slippery with those cups and all of those things. So, you know, that's another place where you just want to like be aware of your feet. Um, just for your own safety and your own peace of mind. Um, you know, I'm one of those people that, you know, I have music going and stuff like that, but I will most of the time turn the music on for the end or, you know, maybe a little bit in the middle, you know, when I just need a little extra motivation, but I have it, I have it off or uh, the volume all, almost all the way down so that I can kind of pay attention to what's going on around me because, you know, people will say things and, you know, talk to you like, hey, watch out and, you know, stuff like that. And actually, I mean, for the most part, nobody's uh, speaking English. So, you know, <laughs> you know, maybe not not necessarily know exactly what they're saying, but you understand like, hey, like I should look around. Um, so, yes, that's a good question, though. Who else? Someone else had a question. Yeah. Um, hi, this is Jim. And uh, when you say pre-orders, Tips. What do you mean? You know, did we send out an email? We need to fill up some form or just at the expo, you know? Yeah. Oh, so the pre order, I believe you had to do all of that when you register for the race. That's, uh, someone can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong about that, but I believe. Um, at least when I when I ran in um, 2019, I did pre order a couple of things like I had a shirt waiting for me um when i got there but i ha it was all back in the registration period 
Um, you can, you know, maybe check now and, you know, look at your account and see if there's anything you can add now. Um, but I, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that maybe that ship has sailed. Yeah, I don't know what the cutoff would be on that, but I do know that there, there were some kind of preliminary things that you had to, you know, select upon registering, but then there are some add-on options that you can add later. I'm just not sure when the cutoff is. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, so if you, if that's, those are things you think you might want to do, like go look today or tomorrow, you know, it's just, see what options are are still available but definitely sooner rather than later i'm gonna see if anybody left anything in the chat there are th maybe things in the chat oh ordered at registration sarah says yeah sarah looked it up thank you sarah for the information Cool. Yeah, of course. Yep. You yeah, know, I, I just looked at the registration pack and I, and I guess when we signed up for the race, you had to pre-order the the chip and the if you wanted to like have a poncho or a bag option. That's great. Yeah, that's what that's kind of that's kind of what I thought in terms of like the uh, Adidas apparel and those kinds of things. Um, there are like there are several Adidas stores within Berlin itself. And so, you know, you just want to make sure you give yourself time for these kinds of things. Um, it's a lot less hectic than the expo if those are, you know, things that you know you want to get. Like the, you know, they have a nice jacket that comes out every year for the race and, you know, official um, shirt and those kinds of things. Um, you're not going to get a shirt with your registration. No one, there, this is Berlin. That's also one of those different things where there's not a race shirt unless you, pay for a race shirt um but there are there, you'll find a lot of options um like i said within berlin itself and um it's a lot less hectic than trying to do it at the expo unless you're going to go to the expo on thursday night if you if you know you're going to be able to go on thursday night then you're going to have all the choices um still there um it's just if you're trying to go at other times you you know there's the popular sizes sell out you know so if, if for women it's um you know the smalls and the mediums they they'll be all gone you know they'll be um you know the f extremes on either side and and so those kinds of things um so you know just just plan accordingly uh for that if there's you know items that that you want to sort of commemorate the race um a fruit this is a comment. I'm just going to read it. Can I, I'm sorry, can I add to that real quick? Yes. Coach, just because I, um, for anybody that is, you know, interested in potentially pre-ordering like a, sh I know that they had add-ons of the jacket, the race, um, you know, race shirt. And then I think like a finishers t-shirt, there might've been one or two other things that you could add after the fact um and i just checked my registration maybe sometime last week and those were still available so it's possible that those might be available to add on but again there might be a cutoff that i'm unaware of that's great yeah so like if there's things that you know you might want the the problem with pre-ordering i remember this when i pre-ordered is that you know like you're you can't try the shirt on like if you pre-order it that's it you're you're only going to get that size and that's that's it um and so you know it, it is a little bit tough for people if you know like you know oh i'm in between a small and a medium i'm not sure what to get um and so you know it's it's totally up to you the pre-ordering is convenient because like i said you're gonna definitely get that size you want they're definitely going to have it for you. Doesn't matter what what day you go, um, and it kind of takes uh, some of that stress out of you know trying to find things. Um, but you know, again, you're not going to be able to try it on with that option. So Kat says a friend ran a few years ago and said if you want the official finisher shirt, you have to order ahead. You can't you oh you can buy other merch at the expo, but the actual race shirt has to be pre ordered. Yeah, so. That's I, I think we're all saying the same thing. There are certain items that you have to pre-order if you want. There are certain items that you can buy there at the expo. 
And there are also items that are available at the Adidas retail stores within Berlin itself. Um, but again, just if these are if this is important to you, like um, then make that a priority of your trip and make that sort of want, you know, not I wouldn't necessarily make it the first thing, but, you know, maybe make it the second thing that you do. Right. And then you can save the sightseeing. You know, there's a lot of other cool things to see in Berlin, the Berlin Wall. There's a lot of um, art and architecture. Um, we did the boat tour when we were there. Uh, we did the bus tour um, when we were there. So um, there's a lot of really cool things to do as well. But just know if like your priority, if you really want to have a souvenir from the race, make that be one of the first things. Anybody else? Ba -ba -ba. Okay. I think maybe that's it. Well, I just want to say thanks, everybody. And um, let me give my last slide, which is my email. And so if you have other questions and you've, you know, you realize later, um, you know, it comes to you in your sleep or whatever, you're like, oh, I really want to know about blah, blah, blah. Feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to, you know, give you any details that I have. Um, I hope everybody has a really great race. This Berlin is, you know, it's a really fun and incredible experience. I think particularly for Americans, you're going to be shocked at how cool it feels like you're going to be surrounded mostly by uh, people that are not American, which is awesome. And, you know, people speaking all kinds of different languages. It's it's a really cool experience. Um, you, you sort of feel a, a, a large part of history. And um, so it's a it's a great race. I hope everyone has a great time. If you're out for, you know, some particular goal or whatever, I hope you reach that as well. Um, but that's it for me, and I want to say good night to everybody. I'm gonna Thank sign you. off. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much.